this Idiot Atheist Reads, we're going to do What Will Happen When Jesus Comes by Dr. John R. Rice. Let's try not to take too long to go on over it, though. What will happen when Jesus comes? I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. John 14, 2, 3. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together we which are alive we notice that notice that we which are alive together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in there and so shall we ever be with the Lord first Thessalonians 4 16 17 of course they try to correct it a little bit second Thessalonians but still it's right there and while they look steadfastly fastly, toward heaven as he went up. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Acts 1, 10, 11. The night before his crucifixion, Jesus told the disciples, If I go, I will come again. John 14, 3. Jesus did go. He ascended up into heaven to prepare a place for us and all the house of many mansions. For our Lord himself shall descend from heaven, said the inspired apostle Paul. First Thessalonians 4.16. Now, let's go ahead and go over what will happen. One, a glad surprise. No one knows this day nor the hour of the Savior's coming. No one knows even approximately when he may come. Yet, Jesus may come at any moment. For 2,000 years they've been saying this. For all those who look forward to the coming of the Savior with hungry hearts, his coming will be glad, glad surprise. This is the teaching of many, many scriptures, all of them inspired of God, most of them from the mouth of the Savior himself. In Matthew 24, 36, 39, the Savior himself gives a solemn warning of the unexpected suddenness of his return. But of that day and hour knoweth no man know, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Even the angels in heaven do not know when Christ returns. No man in the world. <coughs> you cannot tell by measuring the great pyramid, counting the inch for a year, as some foolishly have supposed. You cannot tell by taking the prophecy in and Daniel on making a year mean a day as many have tried to do. God himself knows the difference between a day and a year. When he said day, he meant day. When he said year, he meant year. But he never told, never told when Christ would return. If anyone thinks he has a revelation from heaven and an impression, a leading of the Holy Spirit tells him when Christ will return, he is dead wrong. And we all know all these cults that tell you, Jesus will return today, so give me all your stuff. And people believe it. In these two passages, even the Son himself while he was here on earth had, had purposely limited knowledge. Basically now they're trying to say that Jesus did not know simply because he was in flesh so he purposely limited some of his knowledge. Yet no and he would return. Doubtless now in heaven the Savior knows all that the Father knows and has been glorified with the glory he had with the Father before the world began. But if the perfect Savior while on earth did not know of the time of his return, any other man who claims to know is presumptuous and ignorant, he is mistaken. No one on earth knows when the Savior will return. An old Civil War veteran of the Confederate Army tells how he got home to Mississippi after the long said years of war. He said, after the war was over, a group of us boys from Mississippi struck out for home. We had no horse, almost no clothes, no shoes. Our feet were bleeding and frostbitten, tied up with gunny sacks. Through a wrecked Southland, we trudged our way. Finally, we were within a few miles of home in old Mississippi, foot sore, tired, and weary. The other gaunt soldiers wanted to lie down and sleep and go on the rest of the way in the morning. But Bill said, I am on familiar ground. Just a few more miles and we will be home for breakfast. The other said, we are too tired, let's sleep. But Bill said, no, I'm going home, going to eat breakfast at home in the morning. He left the group, dragged on through the night, and when the first break of day came, he stood on the last hill from his home. He saw the smoke going up from the chimney where his mother was getting breakfast. He forgot he was tired, forgot his bleeding feet. He quickly, he quickened his pace, ran, came to the foot of the hill, to the land, landed up to the house. His young brother Jim, sitting on the rail fence, happened to look his way and saw him. Jim shot through those 
So it was in the house. Yonder comes Billy. Yonder comes Billy. Out came his father and mother and all the family, the slaves, and all came running. They shouldn't have be having slaves. It was the war it should be over. So why would the slaves be all happy? Whites and blacks together struck out down the road. They grabbed him, hugged him, carried him through the house, took off his rags. They bathed him and gave him cl clean clothes. Now together shouted and laughed and praised God for Bill's, Billy's homecoming. While Jesus coming for his own will be as unexpected as that. When we hear the glass shout, behold the bridegroom coming. Go ye out to meet him. It will be a glass surprise. Like a sweetheart who has so long looked for the homecoming of her sh soldier. And of course, before I continue, I forgot to say, you know, feel free to like, subscribe, free to dislike if you choose. Someone's already doing that, so hey, why not? I don't care. Uh, feel free to leave a comment if you choose. I don't read comments. Feel free to check out the description, you know, the link to my website and all that, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I just think that was funny, you know, they mentioned slaves, but since Civil War is over, you know, slavery was made illegal in 1863, you know. Maybe you shouldn't be having slaves. I seriously myself, they were truly happy. How can you be happy when you're a slave? And that's the difference between someone who's religious, any of these religions, and someone who's not. If you're not not religious, then you realize just how bad slavery is. If you are a theist, you look in your holy book, your holy book is all right with it. You should read what some people have said in the past. Uh, there was a Jewish person uh, just before the Civil War who stated, you know, that Hey, it's evil for people to think that, you know, I don't remember his name or the exact quote, so obviously I'm going to screw it up, so hey. But basically he's saying that it's pretty evil and bad for people to be against God. Who are they to judge God's will about slavery? There are many, a glorious resurrection, there are many reasons for Christians to look forward to coming as a Savior. And one of them is that death will be forever conquered by the Christian, and their graves will give up their sainted dead. Early, early death became a reality to me when I was about five years old. My bro baby brother, little Porter, died and left us. Although she had four others, my mother grieved and grieved, and in a few short months, she too lay on her deathbed. There, in a vision, she saw with glad eyes a Savior and her baby. Of course, that's what she wanted to see. She and my cousin sing, How firm a foundation. We wept while she rejoiced. Then we promised to meet her in heaven. She closed her tired eyes, crossed her thin hands upon her breast and smiled and fell asleep. I remember the November day when we laid her body away. My father knelt beside the open grave. There was no white muslin to hide the raw dirt of the grave like a wound in the earth. No fake man-made carpet of grass was thrown over the clouds. My father put one arm around his two little orphan girls and one around his two little boys and watched as they lowered the precious body in its dark casket in the bosom of, her, of Mother Earth. Orphan girls? What the hell? If he's their father, they're not orphans. But that's how they view men and women, though, differently. You know, the girls belong to the mother, boys belong to the father, apparently. Years later, I was preaching a revival campaign, you know, blah, 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 blah. I guess his father dies and all that, you know. When the trumpet sounds of the Savior's coming and the air to receive us, the resurrection of the sleeping bodies of all the Christians of all ages will take place in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, corruption must be put on incorruption. More bodies must be become immortal. The poor decaying bodies that have crumbled back to dust will be reassembled by the mighty power of God. The spirits of the departed saints will return with Jesus and enter into new resurrected bodies. They will be glorified, glorious bodies. They will be bodies never to be sick, never to be weak, never to have pain, never, never to die. You not fret when you remember that the bodies of some saints may have been dissolved in the waters of the seven seas or the other bodies have been burned and the gases have been waved by breezes. Also, some of the gases would have been, you know, given out in the space, too. Don't forget that. But somehow they're all going to come back together. You know, as more and more, those of us who are saved of Christ within us and the presence of His Holy Spirit, our bodies are dead because of sin. Even though we are born again, even though we are Christians, even God's own saints on earth have the sentence of death upon our bodies because we are all sinners. We're all sinners. We're horrible, nasty, disgusting, evil people, including children. Just nasty. It doesn't make sense, you know, because where's this sin coming from? You know, why do you have the sin? Is it because of Adam and Eve, which, of course, we know never existed? They could not have existed. Is that the reason? And besides, why does every innocent person have to be punished because of one person, one or two people did? That makes no sense, you know? 
You see that our created bodies were made subject to vanity, but thank God the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Christians now have saved souls. One day we will have saved bodies. We have now the fruit. We have, we have now the first fruits of the Spirit, but we all taught Christians, even though we ourselves grown with ourselves, uh, waiting for the adoption to wait the redemption of our bodies. The second truth taught in 1 Corinthians 15 is that there will be no split rapture, no division of the saved when Jesus comes. We, we shall not all sleep. No, we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. Some people have thought that only Christians who are filled with the Spirit or those who are sinless and perfect, holy, sanctified, as some people say, will be caught up to meet Jesus, well, Christ in the rapture. But that is not the teaching of the Bible. The Bible teaches that the glorification of our bodies was brought on, bought on the cross. It is a part of salvation. It is all of grace. We don't deserve the salvation of our souls. It is not at the, of works, lest any man shall boast. And we do not deserve the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. A grand reunion for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. We already did that one. First, this is Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. Of course, as I said before, you can go to kingjamesbibleonline.org if you want to read these passages. You can get these at Sword of the Lord Publishers. Note that blessed promise that we which are alive and remain shall be caught together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air. We who will be found living and suddenly changed with glorified bodies when Jesus comes will be caught up together with the Christian dead who are raised and together we will meet the Savior and he will take us to our Father's house. Many a funeral will be broken up when the Savior comes. The first one to be affected will be the corpse for the dead and Christ will rise first. Then the mourners who are Christians will be changed in an instant and caught up with, with the one whom they mourn over and all alike if they are God's children and well united meet the Savior yes it will come, be a grand union for God's children when Jesus comes too many Christians when they come to a funeral do not act like Christians there are too many people who under the stress of party with loved ones on the deathbed and in the cemetery actors of the Bible were a lie as if Jesus would never come oh dear Christian do not be ignorant concerning them which are asleep and do not sorry as others which have no hope what is that to say to people? Others that have no hope, and, but as if Christians don't, you know, you shouldn't be whining over your loved one that just died, your child or your spouse or a parent or whatever, you know. No, you shouldn't because you're saved and you're going to see them again. All those others, they're just nasty. They're going to go to hell and burn forever. So they have to cry. There's not really a huge amount. I mean, all of this is basically the same stuff over and over again. You know, let's see, a grievous separation. Now we can, basically he's going to tell you, you know, you got, you know, you're going to have spouses, you know, husband and wife, one partner saved, the other one's not, so they'll be ripped apart. Children will be unsaved while their parents are saved, or the children will be saved and the parents, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's what, you know, Jesus says, he's going to bring the sword and mother-in-law are going to hate daughter-in-law because he's trying to say well when you get saved your family members are going to hate you because you got saved when actually you know if you become as an atheist a lot of times they're going to hate you for it now if you say oh, I'm a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew or whatever but that's what they're trying to say though when they split apart a lot of people are going to be crying and whining as the, the grave accounting but the story is not all told. When Jesus comes, when the Christian dead are raised and the Christian living are changed and all together caught up in the air to meet Jesus and taken to the Father's house of many mansions, there will be a great account of Christians when they meet their Lord and must give an account of their deeds. In Revelation 22:12, we have the combined promise and warning of the Savior. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his as his work shall be when Jesus comes there will be rewards to give up and those rewards will be different Christ will reward Christians according to their works <coughs> some of us God has sent by this business just as a servant tends to the household of his master while the master has gone along the journey blessed will be the Christian who is busy doing what Jesus said to do when the Savior comes you know like soul winning and all this stuff you know then there of course there'll be others that didn't do anything and they're going to have to answer for that you know, they're not going to go to hell, but they're going to have to answer for it. Well, that's it. What will happen when Jesus comes again? 
Just make sure you have a mop, it, mop and a bucket to clean up all of that mess when Jesus comes again. Now, the last time it was a mess, it's going to probably be a bigger mess this time. Oh, bye.